How can you la 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 without moving? <laughs> you better check that person next to you. Make sure they're... Okay, it's time to go to this one that we've been singing about. Is he worthy? Yeah, he's worthy. I can uh, barely sing that song without uh, tearing up, and it's not normally good to make your pastor cry, especially before he's about to preach, but uh, he is worthy. And I thank God he's taken my sins, never to remember them again. And I know you all can, can praise him for that as well. And that's what I want to do. I know we've got a lot of folks. We've got some folks that are sick today. We've got some of them are in the hospital, you know, and uh, we've got others that are just going through some, some really difficult problems. And it's our time as a church, as brothers and sisters in Christ, to lift them up. You may not know them by name, but, but God does. And so... If you want to just stand where you are, if you want to sit, you want to bow your head, you want to close your eyes, you want to come to the altar, whatever. But we're going before the throne of grace. Physically, you may be coming to the altar here or standing or kneeling there. But spiritually, you are before the throne of grace right now. And the Bible says Jesus Christ is right now interceding for you what's on your heart. So let's give the Lord what's on our hearts this morning both praises and concerns and burdens. Would you pray with me? The Lord, our Heavenly Father, God, we sing of your mercy and your grace, of your compassion. We sing of your love, your nail-scarred hands, your broken body. And we're reminded of the empty tomb and that you now are sitting at the right hand of our Father God. And I pray everyone in the sound of this voice or hear, will hear this voice can call you Father. And Lord, that we have the privilege that you have granted to us because of Jesus to come to you and to cry out to cry out our praises, God, for who you are and what you have done and where you've placed us in this world here in this land of the free and, and still the home of the brave. That we can gather here on Sunday and we can worship you and we can say the name Jesus Christ. We can pray the name of Jesus Christ. We can preach the name of Jesus Christ without any fear. That we can gather here and know that you are right here in this sanctuary. And it's my prayer that your Holy Spirit would just fill the hearts of the people that are here today, Lord. And Father, we do give you our praises. At the same time, you know. You know what, what it is to go through life. On both the mountaintops and in the valleys and somewhere in between, you know what it is to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You've walked through it with Jesus. There's many here, Lord, that, that still grieve over the loss of a loved one. Even years later, Lord. But for those of us who do, and those loved ones knew your son, Jesus Christ, we, we grieve with, with hope, with joy, knowing where they are, even now. Father, as your eyes range throughout this sanctuary, you focus on each heart here today. God is crying out to you silently. There's things that we need. There's things that you know we need. And sometimes you just ask us to ask. Ask and it will be yours. So Father, we're asking. I'm asking you as the, the pastor of these sheep that you have given me. The responsibility to, to nurture, to love, to carry to help, Lord. Touch each heart, each hurt, each anger, each physical, emotional illness, whatever it is, God, that's causing consternation, loss of a job, a financial situation, God, whatever it is. Children or spouses that have gone astray, Father. We lift them to you right now. That's, that's where they need to be. It's the safest place they can be is before the throne of grace. And so we pray, Lord. And Father, I pray that if there's just one person here, even one, 
that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I pray they don't wait till the invitation, Lord. I pray they pray a simple prayer asking you to come into their heart and then coming at the end and during your invitation to share it with us, Lord, so that we can celebrate with them a new life. Father, we do lift up our nation. We lift up our leaders and pray that they would have the courage to turn their eyes towards you and to lead in the way that you desire them to lead, Lord. For this is the nation that you have created. We are your people. Father, we just thank you that we can pray, knowing that you hear from heaven and that you do answer, Lord. So thank you for this time, Father. Before we open your word, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, dear folks. It is always good, I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but it's always good, at least for me, to see, see myself and to see God's people praying and, and, and on their knees in prayer. And there's been so many things lately, uh, so many things uh, that we all know that we just need to be in prayer about, not just for ourselves, but, but what's going on in our families, what's going on in our world today. Um, we just sang, and one of the lines was, do you feel the world is broken? I don't know about you, but uh, I do. Just my opinion, but I do feel the world is broken. I believe America is broken. I believe America, and, and it's a generic statement, I believe America has sold its children to culture. And I think we've got one of the greatest challenges in my lifetime, because the Bible says, train up your child in the way he should go. And when he grows older, he will not depart from the ways, or she will not depart from the ways. We're going to take a look, and if you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. I'm going to begin a series here looking at Daniel because uh, when you look at this text and I study the text and I, and I study the book of, 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 uh, of Daniel, God could have been talking about America on May the 7th, 2023 by what is going on in this first chapter with Daniel and with those that God, and God did it, took those people from Israel, his chosen people, and he sent them into exile. And as I read this in just a, a moment or two, I want you just to kind of imagine thousands of years ago when this was written, Daniel, who is the, the lead character in this, obviously, because it's his book. And where we are today, where you are today, where your children are today, where your grandchildren are today, where your spouses are today, where those who bear the name Christian, they wear the name Christian. But how are they living today? How are we living today? And I've titled this message, as you can see there in your outline, and and I hope you take that outline out. Living a life without compromise. Living a life, living your life, living my life without com compromise. You know, Israel is like America in that it turned from God. And when you turn from God as a nation or you turn from God as an individual, there are going to be consequences. That's just the reality, and, and that's just what the Word of God says. There's going to be consequences. What happened to David in many ways, or, or to Daniel in, in many ways, is, uh, is an image, a mirror of where we are and what's happening to many of us, if not all of us, today here in America. So I think this is just such a a, uh, a powerful time, an important time to look at this book of Daniel. You know, in order to understand Revelation, as much as you can understand Revelation, you have to know the book of Daniel. 
And if you know the book of Daniel, you can understand more about Revelation, but you won't understand Revelation without the book of Daniel. Because there's just so many things here that, that God has inspired and, and, and prophesied here. Maybe some of you, and, 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 I, and I know some of you must have, you've seen those giant redwoods, those giant redwoods out there in California. I mean, they're so beautiful and they're so tall. And uh, they're out there, they're in, in the California forest. And what was very interesting, there was one particular redwood just a few years ago that they say had been there for 400 years, this redwood, for 400 years. And it, it had withstood earthquakes, it had withstood storms, it, 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 it withstood uh, forest fires. Until one day, it just suddenly collapsed. I mean, it just fell down. Christ earth. And, and none of them, none of these experts could understand why. 400 years, and it looked healthy. Why? And it just fell. So they found out when they cut into that redwood that it wasn't the earthquakes and it wasn't the storms that did it in. It was tiny little beetles, tiny little beetles that had been eating the inside of that tree for they don't know, but they estimate for a number of years. A tree died from inside. In the scope of the Christian life, if we make wrong choices today, and I'm glad we've got some young folks here, if we make choices today, there are going to be consequences for those choices for the rest of our life. Forgiveness, yes, but memory, yes. Missing an opportunity, maybe a child doesn't go the way we wanted it to go, that precious child we love, because we just didn't invest in him or her. In other words, America today, I believe, are kind of like that tall redwood. We look strong. Nobody can take us down by earthquake, by storm, by attack. But we can eat ourselves up. We can implode, which is what we're doing today. Now, you can disagree with me, and I'd love to have this conversation, but America is imploding today. No force on this earth can take us down externally, but we're taking ourselves down. We're imploding internally. We're eating up, and we're experiencing a spiritual collapse. Our belief of Christianity... Those who believe Christianity is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Just read an article before I came over here. Didn't, didn't read the article. I, I glanced at the headlines. That Christians reading the Word of God has dropped significantly over the last two years. The Word of God is not important anymore to so many. Beatles. Beetles that are eating away the culture which this nation was established upon. And so I think that, is, again, as we go along here in Daniel, we're going to see that there is, there is a real application, there is real identification to that nation of Israel and to Daniel and what Daniel did as a prisoner, if you will, there in that foreign land. If anything, if we know anything about Daniel, we know about the lion's den. But as we take a look at this, I want to submit to you that without the king's dining room where Daniel refused to eat the king's food, there would be no lion's den. But there was a lion's den because Daniel refused to eat 
So let's take a look at this passage of Scripture this morning, beginning in Daniel chapter 1. I want to pick it up in verse 1. I'm not going to read the entire chapter. It's a long chapter, but so we get the gist of this. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he besieged it. Now catch this. And the Lord gave, the Lord gave, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. <coughs> then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel. Now catch this. Catch who, who the king is telling to bring the, the people. They didn't bring all of them. But listen to what he said. Bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youth without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge and understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. And the king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. And they were to be educated for three years. That's a very important event that is happening there or, or, or part of the plan of this king. They were to be educated for three years. I just want to submit to you, that is a plan of some in America today to educate our children on the way they want them to go, and the way they are educating our children in our public school system today is not according to the Word of God. But then, of course, we can read this and see that this also happened thousands of years ago. Verse 5, the king assigned them a daily portion of food, and the king ate and the wine, and he drank, and they were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among those were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. <clears throat> and then the chief and the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. Verse 8, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself <clears throat> with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs, to allow him not to be, to defile himself. And God gave Daniel, did you catch that? And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And so, if you continue reading there, there's, there's uh, following verses. Daniel said, hey, let us just eat vegetables and water. And after 10 days, you give us a test and you look and see how we look. Are we going to look just like those who are eating the king's food so that they can go before the king and continue to drink his food and drink his wine? Give us that test. And the eunuch agreed to do this even though he feared that something might happen to him. And then going down to verse 17, <clears throat> as these four use. God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. Now, again, you notice that again. God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. That's a, another reason that we're going to see in the latter portion of, of the book of Daniel. Some of these visions that God used Daniel to proclaim that would just absolutely amaze you if you're not aware of the fulfillment of these visions. Verse 18, at the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should uh, be brought in <clears throat> and the chief, of the, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them and among all of them none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better 
than all the magicians and the enchanters that were in his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of the king of Cyrus. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, God, teach us, open our hearts. God, speak to us through your word. We are a nation in crisis today, not just my opinion, God. The reality and the truth is we are a nation in crisis, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually, Father. Don't give up on us, Father. Don't give up on us. Speak to us today, for it's in Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I believe that as we look at Daniel here, in his first years there with Nebuchadnezzar, that we here in Pine Drive and, and some of our other churches can really gain some insight, some commitment that Daniel had to be a church, to be a people living in a kind of young faith that Daniel was living. And I believe we need to hear this today. I believe our teens and our young adults and our senior adults need to be sold out to God. I don't know if you're sold out to God or not. It took me a, a while, even after I became a pastor, I believe, if I'm honest, to be sold out to God. And I don't know if you're sold out to God, but Daniel was sold out to God and some wonderful things God was able to do through Daniel. And we need our kids, we need our young adults, we need our adults and senior adults, even up until the last moment that that senior adult has here on this earth, to live a life without compromise. If I could put, stamp one word on where America is today, it would probably be compromise. Everything is encouraging us to compromise. Some of us are a little smarter because we're a little older, because we've gone through the valleys. We've hit those mountains when we thought we were on the right path. And we knew, we know what it is to be knocked to your face, knocked to your knees, and for God to give you another chance and to pick you up and put you on that right path. You see, the choices that we make, the choices, as I said before, that we make have a tremendous impact on the rest of our life. Now, you may be my age, and I hope somebody here is my age. <laughs> Feel all alone up here. <laughs> Amen. We can make a choice right now at my age or your age, and that can impact the remainder of your life here on earth. It can impact the life of a child, the life of a spouse, by the impact you make. So age is not necessarily the determining factors. Look at our kids today. Compromise. Take one pill, fentanyl, it won't hurt you. Everybody else is doing it. It's not just the kids. It's young adults. It's adults. They're taking drugs. They're taking fentanyl. We've legalized marijuana. We've done all those things. Don't study. Nobody else is studying. Let's go have a party. Isn't that where we are today? And yet we look at Daniel, and what did he do? He made a choice. Because the king was asking him to do the same thing. Eat my food. Drink my wine. And everything is going to be good. Because I'm the king. Well, there are three challenges here that I want us to see. That I believe every person in this room, regardless of your age, there are three challenges here, which I call life's greatest challenges, that you and I are going to experience or have experienced in this life. And there's other ones, but there's three that I see here in Daniel. The first greatest challenge of life is the greatest trial you will ever face. The greatest trial you will ever face is to trust God when your world is falling apart. Hear any amens on that? To trust God when everything falls apart. You had it all planned. 
It was a certainty. Yesterday, yesterday was the Kentucky Derby. I don't know if you saw the Kentucky Derby, but I, I think one of, the, one of the greatest beautiful sights in all sports is the fourth and final turn when those horses are coming around that final turn and they are straining, beautiful, with every fiber on their body. They're straining for that finish line. And, and I, I thought about the time, I've told you this story before, some of you didn't hear it, but uh, when, I was, uh, when I had just gotten out of high school, my best friend's daddy was a bookie. And so uh, we would work the midnight shift and then we'd go to, to, to his daddy's uh, uh, booking place, if you will, and, and we'd place bets on horses. And then uh, in my junior year in college, I had to go to summer camp, so I didn't have the money to finish the year. And so I had a little bit of savings. So my, my friend Dick said, hey, let's go down to Shenandoah Downs in Wheeling, West Virginia to the race. And so I went down there and I took the money that I had, which was about half a semester's. And uh, I bet on this sure thing. It was a sure thing. And guess what? That horse came out of that starting gate and that horse was in the lead. And that horse went around the first turn and it was still in the lead. He was lead, a she, she was a she, you might expect. <laughs> I don't mean that. <laughs> She was going around that turn. She got around to the second turn, and all of a sudden, the jockey stood up on her. And the jockey started pulling back on her, and all the other horses went back. And my heart, while he was doing that, my heart was sinking. I bet my entire college tuition money on a sure thing. True story. After a while, this little truck came out, little pickup or something, and pulled between the horse and the stands, and all of a sudden you heard, bang. They shot my horse, my sure thing, on the back, back stretch. There's a lot of people betting on sure things today, but they aren't betting on the sure thing of the Word of God, of Jesus Christ, of the power of the Holy Spirit, to take any situation that we are involved in, our children are involved in, our families are involved in, and turn it to the truth of the Word of God. And the Word of God is a sure thing. What do you do when your sure thing falls apart? Who do you turn to when the sure thing falls apart? You know, it's tough to move to a new school. It's tough to move our kids to a new community. Can you imagine this totally different culture that Daniel left and went to Babylonia? Didn't understand anybody, didn't understand the language, didn't like the food, didn't want the food that the king offered him. He just wanted to eat vegetables and, and other things. What do you do when your life falls apart? Well, let me, and it's in your outline here. This is so important. When your life falls apart, remember that this theme of, theme of Daniel, if you read Daniel, the theme, all 12 chapters, is that there, and it's very simple, there is a God, and God is in control. And you see it throughout Daniel. I encourage you, read Daniel you will gain insight as a mother, a father, a grandfather, a wife, a husband, whatever it may be, in the battles, the crises you may be dealing with. Even though Daniel was in a totally difficult culture, God was behind him. And God was orchestrating these things. God's behind you. He's orchestrating these things. We can't understand all of them, but God is God. And if you're his child, he is orchestrating everything that's happening in your life. Nothing comes into your life unless it comes through those nail-scarred hands of Jesus Christ that we just talked about. 
And it's easy to trust when things are great. But how easy it is to trust when your world falls apart. Can, can you trust God if your world falls apart tomorrow? There's a second tem- uh, uh, great uh, challenge here, I believe, in, in life, and that is the greatest temptation you will ever face is to compromise your beliefs. The greatest temptation you will ever face is to compromise your belief. You know, Nebuchadnezzar was pretty shrewd. He was, he was really shrewd. He knew, listen to me, if he could change the hearts and the minds of the children, then he could have them the rest of his life. When I was commanding an aviation unit down in, uh, in Panama, we were supporting the, the Contras there in El Salvador as they were fighting the Sandinistas. And one day we got a call to pick up this prisoner from, from uh, Nicaragua, this, this general that had been captured. <clears throat> And one of the interrogators asked him, how, how do you get the support of, of all these people, of the adults? He says, we don't worry about the adults. We train these children beginning in first grade about Sandinistas and about our government. And then we don't have to worry about them. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Who's training up your child? Who's training up your your grandchildren? You know, uh, sound familiar? Yes. Kids and grandkids need to know the values. They need to know the values so that they can make those decisions that are going to affect them for the rest of their life. And let me tell you, you know this. Where those critical decisions need to be made when they leave home and they go to college. If they're going to a non-Christian university today, and sadly, even some Christian universities, they're not going to get the way they should go. They're not going to get the wisdom to make those decisions that they need to make that are going to impact the rest of their life. Turn very quickly to 1 John. John's first uh, letter, John. 1 John, all the way back there after 1, 2, and 3 Peter, near the end of the Bible. And look at chapter 2 of 1 John. In verse 15, John says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. What happened to Daniel 2,600 years ago is happening today to many of the children in our grade schools, our pre, pre, uh, uh, pre-grades, uh, pre-kindergarten, in our, in our kindergartens, it's happening in our, in our high schools. It's happening in our colleges and, and universities. And they're not being taught the truth of Jesus Christ. What's teaching our children today? I didn't say who. I said, what is teaching our children today? What's teaching our young adults today? What, unfortunately, is teaching some of our adults today? Well, it's godless secular music. It's godless TV programs. It's it's godless internet. It's uh, godless music. It's godless movies. We're being immersed in a world that is not the world that God created in America when he created this nation. And we're being immersed in all these things. And it's coming hot and heavy. Our kids need to be immersed in a Christ culture. Kids need to be 
immersed in seeing their parents, making them, if that's what it takes, to come to church, to go to Sunday school, to go to youth camp. Sometimes it's the parents' responsibility to make sure that that happens. You know, this, this is huge. And Daniel and his three Hebrew boys, listen to me, they weren't persecuted. They were not persecuted. They were not beaten. They were not threatened. Our kids aren't being persecuted. Our young adults aren't being persecuted. They're not being threatened. They're being enticed. That's what the king did. He enticed them. He enticed them with his good food, with this good, rich red wine. What's getting our kids today? What's getting our young adults? What's taking people, Christians, that once were solid Christians in church and reading the Word of God and praying and following the Word of God? What's taking them away? It's not persecution. It's enticement. We are being enticed today. Daniel had a choice. And he could have compromised and been like everybody else. But what did he do? He said, no, no. Now look at three, there in your outline, three crises that, that we saw here and that we see here that Daniel faced and I believe that, that perhaps we face or will face or can face today. Number one, Daniel faced an authority crisis. An authority crisis. What is truth? Do you ever talk to somebody and say, this is the truth, this is the word of God, and they say, well, what's true to you may not be true to me. What you believe, I don't believe. In our culture today, if I don't believe what they believe and I don't compromise with what they believe, then, then I've got a problem. Did you know that did you know that because I believe and preach the word of God that it is inerrant? We just went through. God wrote a book. Do you know that because I believe and I preach that this word of God is inerrant, that I would be classified a hypocrite today, or even a racist? Do you know because I preach that homosexual is a sin against God? that I would be classified as a heretic, a racist today. Do you know that because I believe that abortion is murder, that I would really be classified as a heretic today? I told you this story very quickly. I used to put the title of a sign on the sign out here until one day. One day I put the title on the sign and I said, homosexuality, lifestyle or Christ style. My phone lines burned up that Monday. The things that people said about me were just unbelievable. No, they weren't. They were, were believable. To face an authority crisis, we have to stand on what is the truth. The second crisis is to face the identity crisis. Who am I? Let me ask you, who are you? Who am I in terms of the Word of God, in terms of the Christian? Who are you? Don't tell me. Who are you as God is your witness? And this is, you know, it, it's something very interesting here. Uh, Bel uh, the king gave Daniel a new name, and the new name was Belteshazzar. Servant of Baal is what it means. But don't miss this. You know what? Throughout the book, God was behind the scenes. God was in charge, and Daniel's name was used throughout the rest of this book. Throughout all the 12 chapters, he was Daniel. He was Daniel to God. He was Daniel as he put this word in God's inspired were uh, in, in his inspired word. Why did he do that? He saw that he saw that this teenager, about fourteen years old, this teenager was honoring God. He was standing on the word of God that they had at that time, that he had at that time. 
and he saw that he was a faithful servant. If you're a born-again Christian, then, then we have to be unashamed of identifying ourselves with Jesus Christ in our schools, in our homes, in the church, in our businesses, wherever it may be. Because I'm not going to compromise, and I know you're not going to compromise as well. Daniel said, I'm not going to act like the way of the king of Babylon. I'm going to act like the, my king of kings and my lord of lords. That's where my behavior comes from. That's who I serve. I pray we all can say that this morning. You know, friend, morally and spiritually, America's bankrupt. I said we're imploding physically and emotionally and spiritually. But the message of that is you can't sin against God with impunity. Not as a nation, not as a family, not as a person, an individual. You cannot sin against God without impurity. There are going to be consequences. And sin always leads to death. If there's someone here who has never received Jesus Christ and you're still living in sin, and that sin is going to, live, going to end in your death, and that's the death that isn't going to take you to heaven, it's the death that's going to take you to hell. Just what the Bible says. There's a third, third uh, great challenge here, and that's the greatest triumph is to stay pure in the midst of moral decay. To stay pure in the midst of moral decay. I think one of the greatest verses of, of this entire letter or a book here in Daniel is verse 8. Look at verse 8 again with me. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Verse 9, And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. We stand in a godly culture, but we must stand in the face of this godly culture and say, I will not defile myself. Doesn't it break your heart when you're around teenagers? Breaks your heart other times, but, but especially when you're around teenagers at, uh, at a mall or they're just at a gathering or something, and you hear the foulest language that comes out of their mouths. Where did that come from? It didn't come from the king. Probably learned a lot of it at home or at school. But doesn't that break your heart? And we need to say, you're using the name of my Father and my God in vain. And there's going to be a consequence for that. Well, what do you do? I guess my encouragement this morning, we're out of time, but what do you do? My, my encouragement to, do, to you is to dare to be a Daniel. Read this. Read it in detail. Read some more of Daniel. Dare to be a Daniel. I will stand on the Word of God because it is a foundation and it's not saying that I'm going to sink. This is, is my Word. Well, what do you do? When you make a decision to be Daniel, let me give you four things very quickly. When you make a decision to be a Daniel, I didn't say to be a Christian, I said to be a Daniel. You're already a Christian. It will be a hard decision. It will be a hard decision. It takes thousands of times more courage to go against the flow than it does to stand on, to go along with them and everybody else. What is a blessing? Let me tell you what the blessing is when you stand. Now, I know, women, you look in the mirror. When I look in the mirror, I can shave the next morning because I stood on the Word of God. I stood on the Word of God. And God is living in me. And I didn't shame myself. And I didn't shame the Holy Spirit. And I didn't shame my name, the name of my Savior that went to the cross for me. 
I did the right thing. Be a Daniel, but it's going to be hard. Secondly, to be a Daniel, it's going to be a humble decision that you have to make. It's going to have to be a humble decision. Did you notice there, Daniel wasn't obnoxious to the king? He wasn't looking down at the king. Hey, you don't know. I've got an education. Look at my good looks. That's one of the reasons you chose me. I know the Bible. I know who my God is, and he's going to protect me. He didn't do that. He humbly went to the king, and he said, to the eunuch, he said, would you just test me? Test us, my buddies, for 10 days and see if God doesn't take care of us to the point where we can go before the king. In fact, the Bible says, as we read, they were 10 times better than any person that went before the king. Thirdly, we will be honored by our decision. You will be honored by your decision to stand on the word of God. God always honors spiritual commitment. He honored David many years later in his life when, he was, when Daniel was thrown into that pit along with the lions. And what did, how did God honor him? He shut the mouths of those lions. And they never touched David. That was an honor. And if Daniel had not shut his mouth at the king's table with his food, there would never have been lions to open their mouths that God would shut there in that lion's den. Fourthly, will you get, when, you, when you make this decision to be a Daniel, it will give you God's power to stay pure. It just will. God will honor that. He will give you the power to stay pure. He will give you the power as he has given me to clean up my language, to do away with anger, to whatever it is that you need to be clean up because we want to come before this pure God because one day we will come before this pure God. God is looking for vessels. Listen to me. God is looking for vessels today that he can fill up with his power and use to our culture, even the world, to save people, to bring people to the saving grace of Jesus Christ, to turn marriages around, to turn financial situations around, to bring encouragement to people who say, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. Brothers and sisters in Christ, join me in being a Daniel in all that we do. Would you pray with me? The Lord, our Heavenly Father, God. Lord, we need you today. We look at the headlines. We see, Lord, it used to be maybe every few months, then it became every month, and And now it seems like it's every week that people are killing people. Or teenagers are committing suicide, either intentionally or through fentanyl or another drug. Lord, these are your children. You created them. We need to be strong, God. We need to be faithful. We need to stand against the things that are harming our children, our young adults, or adults. We need to stand against those who stand in the pulpit and do not preach the word of God. Father, whatever it is, thank you for standing behind us. Thank you when you see, even now as I'm praying, when you see a heart of a parent or a grandparent It says, God, protect my children, that you will do that. God, you will. Father, I pray that as we stand here for your invitation, as for his business that needs to be done with you, not with me, but with you today, Lord, God, that they would do it. They would have the courage to make that decision to receive Christ or have the courage to make that decision to recommit their life. And Lord, if there's one person that does not know Jesus, let them just simply say, Dear Jesus, it's me. 
Forgive me of my sin. Help me to repent. God, save me. By the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, save me. And God, because this is faith, I believe that no matter how I feel at this moment, you have saved me. You have sent the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, into my life. And Father, if there's a heart here today that needs prayer desperately, God, let them come. God, let them come. And if there's a heart that's looking for a church home where they can be loved, where they can be healed, where they can be used, God, then our doors are open. Father, whatever it is, this is your invitation. God, let us respond. In Jesus Christ, power and name, we pray. Amen. Would you stand?